find the book of Joel. Yes, let's stand and let's read God's Word together. Joel chapter uh, 3, if you would, Keith. And I think we're going to read to verse 9 is what I decided today. Joel chapter 3, and let's read together beginning at verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things." Now the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to Sabians, to a people far off. For the Lord hath spoken it. Now finally, verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Who knows what recompense means? It means to reward or to pay back. God is a God of justice. God is a God who, who if you would, pays back. Pays back evil with judgment pays back good with blessing. Let's pray. Father, we would desire to be on your side and not man's side. Lord, we know that you are the God of eternity. You're the Alpha and the Omega. We know that our times are in thy hand. Lord, as we've read today, we know that you're sovereign God. We know that who will be president, you already know that. Who's going to be governor? You know that. Who will be king? You know that. But Lord, we also know this, that you have laid out your plan of redemption, and our hope is in Jesus Christ. Lord, bless your word today. I pray that as we look at these prophecies that are not yet come true, that we know that as surely as you have kept your word up to today, you will keep your word until eternity. Lord, we trust you. Now we pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, give us understanding, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I hope that you have the outline. You're probably going to want it as we go through this. And I want to give you a little bit of the setting. If you have your Bible, go back with me to Joel chapter 2. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 28. The title of the message is, The Day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. And I wanted to review with you some of what we've already studied. Go back and look at verse 28 of Joel chapter 2, and I'll read and you follow as I read. Now this was the setting that came, uh, was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and and also upon the servants upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit now all that has come to pass that happened on the day of Pentecost 50 days after after Christ rose from the dead, 10 days after he ascended into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, all of the followers of Christ, at least that core group, they were gathered and they were waiting in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, if you remember, there came a sudden sound as of a mighty wind from heaven. And that sound that was descending was none other than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
not only rested upon, but indwelt the believers. And they began to speak in unknown tongues to them. That is, in other tongues, literally in other languages. Now, Acts chapter 2 said that there were gathered in Jerusalem. This is after uh, uh, the Passover. There were still gathered in Jerusalem many Jews that were from all over the known world. And they began to hear the gospel shared in their own language. Well, they stood back and wonder until Peter stood. Peter stands in, in the midst of this crowd that has gathered to listen to the things that are being said. And there he begins to preach Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, buried and raised from the dead. It was in that hour that the gospel was spread. And it came true what we read in Acts 2, you have your Bible, and verse 32. Look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. What Peter did not realize was that the gospel that he was preaching, it wasn't just for the Jews. The gospel that would be preached to the Gentiles. And so we see now this fulfillment that was in Acts 2, beginning at 28, verse 29, and all the way down to verse 32. But there's a moment that we must look at in Acts 2, going back and looking at verse 30, and realizing not all of Joel's prophecy has been fulfilled. On your outline. We're going to look today at the day of the Lord. Now, a day can be in our literal sense of 24 hours, or it can be in a sense of a, a season. You know, we are in a sea, uh, we're in a, I, I could say, we're in a day of great depravity. Well, you understand, it doesn't mean depravity is just today. But it means in a sense of a season of depravity and sin. And so when we use the expression, the day of the Lord, we're not dealing with exactly a specific day, but we're dealing with a season of time that will culminate in a day. Now, let me walk you through this outline a little bit and give you some background. I, I want to say this. There are different interpretations and you might differ with what I'm going to present to you. That's okay. We can differ on interpretations. What we can't differ on are the solid truths. Amen? And so let's look at this. Let me give you a, a definition of the day of the Lord. And this is on your outline, I believe. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. That is what I believe. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for what? The uptaker. You have your hand in your Bible at Joel. I invite you to turn with me just for a moment to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, I don't believe this is on the PowerPoint, Keith. It's up to you if you would like to go there. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, would you turn there? And this has been the hope of the believers down through the century, since the first century. We are still waiting for this time to come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, the first century church. They're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing trouble. And some of those who believed and trusted in Christ have died. They have been buried. And the people are wondering what is going to become of the church. We thought the Lord was going to come back. He hasn't come back. What about those who have died in Christ? What is going to happen? The answer to that is in 1 Thessalonians 4. You follow as I read. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep is another way of defining death. By the way, the believers who die in Christ in faith are asleep. They're waiting for the sound of the trumpet and their bodies will be raised from the dead. Now, to die in Christ 
is to be present with the Lord, okay? So we understand, we don't believe in the soul death, we understand the physical death. But when a believer dies, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why? Because we are then with the Lord. Now, let's follow verse 13 again. Now, we would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not or be overcome with grief, even as others which have no hope. Brother Rob's sitting here today. I've known his mom and dad for 25 years probably at least, and I know that they know the Lord. And I know that you sorrow in the sense of the loss of your dad, but you rejoice in knowing he knew the Lord and he loved the Lord. What a wonderful thought that is. Now look with me at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died, here's the gospel, and rose again, even so them also which sleep are deceased in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or literally precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and then this closing thought verse 18 wherefore comfort one another with these words here's a question is it a comfort for you and for me who have buried our loved ones and we know that they knew the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior would you say that first Thessalonians 4 is a comfort absolutely it is a hope It is a promise, and it is that upon which we wait. Now, let's go back to your outline. So it began, the day of the Lord, this is what I believe. I believe that it begins with the rapture of the church. I believe that after the rapture of the church, there is a season of seven years of tribulation. Now, we're not diving into the deep end on some of this today. But we do know that the Scripture talks about a season of seven years of tribulation. The last three and a half years considered and defined as the great tribulation. Now, another thought on your outline. We also understand that this day of the Lord concludes with the return of Jesus Christ. His second coming. The final event on the calendar of the day of the Lord is the battle of Armageddon. Now, I want to move forward with that and invite you to turn again Revelation chapter 19. Would you go there? Look with me at Revelation 19. And in Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11, we see prophesied what we're going to read about in the book of Joel. So Joel is looking, it's estimated anywhere from 700 B.C. to as late as 500 B.C. So Joel in his writing is writing about some things that were immediate, some things that were near, and some things that were afar off. As he writes in Joel chapter 3, he describes the battle of the nations. He describes the nations, the Gentile nations of the world, being gathered at and against Jerusalem. He is prophesying that now for us, what would be 2,800 years ago. Now let's follow. You have your Bible again, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, this is John writing, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire, that is, one of judgment. On his head were many crowns, that is, his authority. And he had a name or a title written that no man knew but he himself. He, the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ, was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now notice verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And so here's the picture. 
The second coming of Jesus Christ is that he suddenly, at a time that only God the Father has known and has appointed, suddenly heaven opens and the Lord Jesus Christ comes out of heaven triumphant and he and the armies of heaven are making their way towards the earth. They have a destiny at Jerusalem. They have an appointment with the armies of the nations of the world. Continue with me, if you would, in verse 14, or verse 15. And out of his, the mouth of the Lord Jesus, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of fierceness in the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now verse 18 and verse 19, we understand that the beast, the Antichrist, he is the one that is going to be the world ruler on this earth. And you can watch in the news today, there is a movement in the world and the powers that be. They are looking for a global unity. One of the battles being fought in the United States even now is against those who believe in the Constitution and the, the independence of these United States and others who have an inclination of globalness. That globalness at the sacrifice of our independence as a nation. The United Nations, which I believe is going to really be the, the pinnacle of, of gathering all this. The United Nations already tries to extend into sovereign nations like the United States an authority that overrides the constitution of those nations. And so we're watching in our culture today, a battle that is a strategic battle between good and evil. It is not a matter of the United States and we who are the citizens and, and over here are, is the rest of the world. This is a battle that goes back to the fall of Satan. This is a battle that is being waged and will be waged until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that was a lot, but you got your money's worth, all right? Would you take your Bible again and go to Joel? In Joel chapter 2, we're going to see unfolding that which is to come to pass. On your outline, letter B, I believe it is, Jew and Gentile will be saved during the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is going to be a horrendous time. It's going to be a time of great suffering and a time of great sorrow. But it will also be a time that some will turn to Christ. You have your Bible there. Would you follow with me? And uh, Joel chapter 2, this has not come to pass, but on your outline, I want you to understand this, that when the Lord's judgment is drawing near, creation itself will be affected by the terror of God's judgment. Look with me at Joel 2 and verse 30. And I will show you wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Notice this, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why all this terror? Why the changes in the heavens that man would be watching and that man would notice? It is to move in the heart of men an understanding of God's coming of God's judgment and quite honestly to turn the heart of men from sin to Jesus Christ. Notice another thought in verse 32. It is, uh, it is though it is a day of judgment, God's judgment is not without His mercy. Look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be 
delivered. Well, whence is this salvation? Verse 32, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And so this, this time of tribulation, even the, the, the awfulness, the terrible trials that the world is engulfed in right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is still an opportunity for those who are lost to turn to Jesus Christ. But then I want to give you a third thought on this. Not only is God merciful, but I want you to understand that God is gracious. Aren't you glad the salvation is not based upon you meriting God's favor? Because we are sinners. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so we understand in the very essence of who we are, we are sinners. There is, is nothing within us that is good. Somebody would say, well, well, preacher, there's some things about me that are good. Well, you might be good in some standard that we could hold up compared to others. But when you compare your goodness to the holiness of God, we all fall short. Now notice then this thought, and I want you to see this, and you know these verses. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9. To realize that God is long-suffering. And even up to the moment of the second coming of the Lord Himself, that He's still not willing that any should perish. He's still waiting. Maybe you're here today, or maybe you're listening online. I want to tell you that the way of salvation is, is still through the cross. It is still through Jesus Christ. Another question, is it too late for America? Well, Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14. This is applied to Israel, but knowing that God is consistent, let it be said this, that God still sees men, women, and I would pray nations, that we would humble ourselves and we would cry out to the Lord. What will become of America, I know not. Now, here's a thought for your outline, and we'll dive into Joel 3. Revelation 19. Revelation 19 gives us the day of the Lord from the perspective of the church. Joel chapter 3 gives us the day of the Lord from the perspective of Israel. And so, as we go to the book of Joel, chapter 3, Joel is preaching and prophesying to Israel. He is calling that nation to repent. He is putting out the truth that there is a day of judgment that is coming. And remember, we've already studied in Joel chapter 2, he, he compared it to this, this swarm of locusts that would come in. In Joel chapter 1, rather. Joel chapter 2, he compared it to the armies that were coming that were fulfilled in Babylon. It was fulfilled by Assyria. But now in Joel chapter 3, we're at a time that has not yet come. Look in your Bible and follow me on your outline with this thought. There are two gatherings in Joel chapter 2. The first gathering is the gathering of God's people, the Jews, to Jerusalem. It is the gathering that will take place during the tribulation. Now look with me. Joel chapter 3, look with me at verse 1. For behold, in those days... And in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. The, the idea of bringing the captivity is to gather together all of those who would identify with Israel. All of those who would be Jewish, of Jewish descent. And so Joel is preaching, and he's saying there's going to be a day... It is a day in verse 32 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. It is a day that I will gather together all of Israel and Judah, uh, Judah and Jerusalem. I'll gather together all my people. Now here's a question. Did that happen at Pentecost? Not a trick question. Was the goal of Pentecost to gather all the Jews together? And the answer is no. It was just the opposite. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it was that you shall be witnesses uh, uh, unto me unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so in Acts chapter 2, instead of the gathering together, it actually ended up being the scattering. And so they scattered out into the world, and what did they do? Just like the missionaries' PowerPoint, they were taking with them the gospel. It began in Jerusalem, and over time it began to expand throughout Europe, ultimately working its way down into Africa. And so as, we, as we're looking at missions conference, here is the fact that we're still waiting for the gathering of the Jewish people. Now, another thought, it has not yet happened. However... On May the 14th, 1948, before I was born, I'm going to go ahead and add that, before I was born, when some of you were uh, alive, there was a decision that was made. It was pushed for by the United Nations. It was also, uh, Great Britain was very instrumental of this. After World War II and the great Holocaust that was suffered by the Jewish people, a state was established once again in Jerusalem or in Israel. And it was just a slither of the land that is in the scriptures that we find there. But that 70 years ago now has passed. And all the Jews are still not in Israel. In fact, I think the number is some 6 million, uh, close to 7 now, are actually in Israel Another 12 million actually live in these United States. And then the rest are scattered all over the world. And so the gathering that we read in Joel 3 verse 1, this gathering together, the captivity, it hasn't happened yet. But you know, all of God's promises that we see in Scripture that have been fulfilled gives us this hope that day is coming. And there will be a gathering together. Now, I'm going to invite you to notice then verse, uh, verse 1 again, the who. So we dealt with the when. I believe it's the tribulation. Let me deal with the who for a moment. Who are these that are going to be gathered? And the answer is in verse 1 again, I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now here's a question. Does Judah have all of her land to herself as a nation? The answer is no. Uh, the Palestinians are there. Syria encroaches. You have all of these encroachment of other nations and other people. The reality is this. Israel as a nation is surrounded by enemies. And I know our president has been working hard to bring peace. But we know in the scriptures it is a temporary peace at best. There will not be peace until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now, on your outline, let's deal with the second part. The first gathering, bringing the Jews back to uh, Israel. Not fully taken place yet, partially in 1948. There was an establishment of a nation called Israel. Do you realize since 70 A.D., Israel as a nation had been scattered? There was no Israel. The, the area of, of, of Jerusalem and all of that that surrounded, it was occupied by Jewish people. It was occupied by uh, Christians. It was also and predominantly occupied by Arabic people. But in 1948, the gathering began. It will not be finished until Joel chapter 3, verse 1 is accomplished. Now, let's look at the second gathering. Notice then, if you would, this thought, and we're going to read in a moment, that all nations, all nations, the armies of the world are going to be gathered at and against the Jews. Notice, if you would then, Joel chapter 3, verse 2. Here's the first thought, when, when. When is this going to happen? And the answer to that is after the captivity of Judah has been brought to Jerusalem. So that has to be accomplished. And that will be accomplished during the tribulation. But notice the where. Where are these armies, these nations? Where are they going to be gathered? And the answer is Jerusalem. 
and against Jerusalem. You follow in your Bible now. Joel chapter 3, verse 2. Now we're going to deal with the where. Joel 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations. And God says, and I'm going to bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, let me pause there. Who is, who is leading all of these nations? Who, who is the, the one that has that power and that authority to influence this movement of all the nations of the world against Israel? And the answer is the Antichrist. It is Satan's last push with the Antichrist to bring the nations of the world and try to destroy the chosen one, the chosen people. Now follow with me then, and I want you to notice the valley. This valley is known by two names, all right? Still looking at the where. Verse 2, I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now look at verse 12. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit, the Lord speaking, to judge all the heathen round about. And then look in verse 14. There's a second name. Not only the, the valley of Jehoshaphat, but notice in verse 14, the valley is called the valley of decision. Joel 3 verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, here's a question, if I haven't lost you. Where is the valley? It's one thing to know the name of the valley. It's something else to know where is this valley. And I believe I have the answer for you. Again, you can disagree. We're okay. I love you. Hopefully you love me, all right? So where is the valley? Let's define Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means literally Jehovah judges. All right, so this valley is not given an exact location by Joel. But there's another passage that tells us exactly where it is. And I invite you, would you take your Bible, turn with me over to Zechariah. Zechariah, uh, moving over just a few uh, pages in your Bible, Zechariah chapter 14. So what we're going to do is try to locate the valley. Where is this valley of decision? Where is this valley of Jehoshaphat? Where is this valley where the nations of the world, and God says, and I'm bringing them in, I'm drawing them into this place that is a place of Jehovah judges. Look with me, Zechariah chapter 1. It's some of us on the PowerPoint. You might want to follow though as we read. Zechariah then, chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. Divided by the enemies of Israel. The word spoil, I believe, is probably the men and women of Israel, the Jewish people. Now, verse 2. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city of Jerusalem shall be taken. The houses rifled, the women ravished, half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. In other words, half of the city is going to be destroyed with the people. The other half are, will be fleeing away from Jerusalem and away from the armies that are found there. Now, why is that important? Look with me at verse 3. In verse 3 we read, Then, at that moment... At, all, at, the, at the moment in which everything seems lost, at that moment that it appears that, that Satan and the Antichrist and the nations of the world that have always hated the Jewish people, at that moment when it finally seems that they will be annihilated, in verse 3, at that moment, then shall the Lord go forth. The idea there is as a warrior and fight against those nations as when he had fought in the day of battle. Here's the location of Jehoshaphat. Where is that valley? Verse 4. And his, the Lord, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. All right, we have the location now, right? How many of you have been to Israel? Any of you? Yeah, many of you. Been on the Mount of Olives, right? And you stand there. And you're looking out over the city 
of Jerusalem. So when the Lord is coming, He is coming at the moment that all would seem lost. And He comes and He stands, verse 4, upon the Mount of Olives. Now notice what happens. Which is before Jerusalem, on the east side of the walls, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave, literally shall split, in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very, what? Great valley. And there shall be a, a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove to the, toward the north, the half of it towards the south. So, let's go back. Valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel says it's the valley of Jehoshaphat where the armies are going to be gathered. It is the valley of decision. Zechariah then writes that when the Lord comes, He'll stand on the mountain, and the Mount of Olives shall suddenly be cleaved in half, and a great valley will form there. Now this valley area somewhat exists today. The Kidron Valley is about 20 miles in length. But obviously that is not the valley itself because the valley is formed by the splitting apart of the Mount of Olives. Now, what about Armageddon, right? Final battle, Revelation 16, Megiddo, it's... What about that? Here's what I believe happens. In this passage of Scripture, you've read in verse 2 about the women being ravished, half the city shall go forth into captivity. There will be a retreat of the people out of the city. I believe that they're going to be moving up towards where the final battle will be staged. The battle of Armageddon. Now, we'll go into that later. My time is almost gone. But I want to answer the question, why? Why is this judgment? Why now? And I want you to understand, God loves His people. I believe that He's not just jealous of Israel and the Jews. I believe He's jealous of His people. Now let me say this, Israel today is a secular nation. You know that. They, the idea of the freedom of worship is not in Israel. But there will be a day that there will be a gathering of those who love the Lord. Go back, Joel chapter 3, and I want to answer the question, why? I wish there was time to go into this, and maybe I will in a a later time. Let me go through this just quickly. You have your Bible, Joel chapter 3, and let's start reading at verse 2. All right, Joel 3, verse 2. Let's read the verse. You follow. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which we have already seen will be outside of Jerusalem. And And the Lord says, and I'm going to plead, with those nations for my people and my heritage, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now notice the crimes. Here's the key point here. Why this judgment of the nations, Pastor? Verse 3, because of the crimes that the Gentile nations have committed. Verse 3, and they have cast lots for my people, sold them as slaves. They have given a boy for an harlot to use and to abuse boys sexually. You know, we're living in that day. Do you know that? It's a day of sexual traffic all over the world. And so the Lord is is indicating here in verse 3 that I'm going to judge the nations of the world for this gross depravity that they've taken boys and used them as harlots. Not only that, they've sold a girl for wine that they might drink. If I had time to go into it, how many young girls have been sacrificed because of drugs and alcohol in this culture? You see, we are living in a day that is a day of gross wickedness. 
that really has not been seen since the times of the Romans. And now that time has come again. And then I want to take you through the who and we'll close. Look with me again. You have your Bible, Joel chapter 3. And I invite you to look at verse 4. Here's the who, and we close. Yea, and what have ye to do with me? Now, remember who's going to be gathered for the final judgment? All nations. But then there are specific nations and city-states. In verse 4, Tyre and Sidon, uh, th- those would be cities of Phoenicia located along the coastline north of Israel. All the coast of Palestine, probably the Philistines area, Philistia. We will, well, ye render me a recompense, and that is a reward. And so the judgment is this. It's against those nations who have been the enemies, the oppressors of God's people. Now, I'm going to close with this by inviting you to look with me at uh, some of the crime. Uh, Once again, in verse 5, you have taken my silver and my gold. You've carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. In other words, you've abused my people. You've taken that which, belong, which I gave to Israel as an her- inheritance. You have taken it from them. Verse uh, uh, 6, The children of Judah and the children of, of Jerusalem have you sold into the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. And then, behold, I'll raise them out of the place. I'm going to stop with this because I, I, I'm out of time. The jealousy of the Lord for His people is without a doubt something that you and I understand. America, in many ways, I believe, was blessed because when it came to the Jewish people, America showed a heart and a concern. But there are going to be the nations of the world that are going to be gathered. Whether or not America is going to be among them at that end of times, I don't know. But I know that they're going to be gathered against Jerusalem. And they are, as as a wicked people under the leadership of the Antichrist, are thinking that they're finally going to destroy God's chosen people. And God Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to come out of heaven with the sound of thunder and lightning and the armies of heaven are coming with Him. And He is coming to finally deal with justice, the nations of the world, for their wickedness and the harm of His chosen people. And I want to close with a couple of questions. What should I do? If I believe that all of this is true, what should I do as a believer? And I'm going to give you two thoughts and I close. The first is this. You and I should be watching for Christ's coming. It is the rapture. We should be waiting. We should be watching. I wish I had time to go into that. I think of Luke 12, verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. The Lord so cometh as a thief in a night. When I was a young believer, and I began hearing preaching on the rapture and the tribulation, it scared me good. Because I understood that God was a God who is just and God is holy. And that there will be a day that His people will be judged. I believe at between the rapture and the second coming of Christ, there will be the judgment seat. And there you and I who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we will not be judged as unbelievers, we'll be judged as believers. And then our works will be judged, whether it is wood, hay, and stubble, or it's that which is going to last and be eternal. I'll give you two thoughts as I close. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, we should be watching for Christ's coming, and Christ's judgment will precede His coming. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The word fire is literally that idea of judgment. 
2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let me ask you this. Preachers used to preach, and they would always ask in the closing, Are you, as a believer, ready for His coming? Are you ready to stand in the shadow of His throne and before His judgment? The world is going to go through a horrific time of great sorrow and suffering like the world has never known. You and I at that same time, that hour of tribulation, will be judged on our works. Are you ready for is coming. It's about an eyes closed. Our Father, as we close this morning, how we thank you for the insight into eternity. The understanding that you have given us of these times that will come to pass. And some have already come, the day of Pentecost, the, the spread of the gospel throughout the world. And we who are here this morning, most of us are Gentiles in our, in our past, in our birth. And so we, we understand the, this unfolding, this hope of salvation that was promised to Abraham. That through his seed, all the world would be blessed. And Lord, that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, buried, raised from the dead. And Lord, we do wait upon your coming. Maybe it'll be today, and maybe it will be tomorrow. But Lord, it is my prayer for Hillsdale, it's my prayer for our church, it is my prayer for me, Lord, that when that time should come, we are ready to stand in your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the hope of salvation that is in Jesus Christ. But Lord, I pray for us today that as we look at a lost and dying world, that we would understand that the eternal clock is still moving. It's still moving to that destiny and that moment when all the nations of the world are going to be gathered against your people. And Lord, you will suddenly burst out of heaven and you will come to deliver that remnant lord may you find us faithful i pray and lord as we bow before you there may be someone online might be someone here today and they're not ready maybe they don't even know you as savior lord it would be my prayer right now that they would understand that they're sinners just like we were all born sinners but they would also understand not only is the wages of sin death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, I pray that that lost soul right now would say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that your son Christ died for my sins. And I ask you today, Lord, be my Savior. Lord, I pray for our young people today, our college students and our young families. Lord, that we would realize that we may not have all before us that we thought we had. That there may be a time, and it may be soon, that you surely will come. And Lord, I pray that we'll share with those that we love the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the truth. Now, I pray that you would bless this hymn of invitation as we sing. Lord, work in us. Pray that there will be within us a sense of yielding to your will, accepting your plan, knowing your love. Lord, may you find us faithful in Christ's name. Let's stand.